Okay, good. So, okay, I think thanks a lot for the invitation uh, uh, tonight, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today with uh, such a great lineup of speakers, exciting lineup of speakers in our field. And um, so I'd like to start and uh, explain a little bit uh, what it is all about with this quantum simulation connection to quantum computing, put it in perspective, and I think maybe hopefully also lay the basis for some of the talks that will that will come afterwards. So I want to talk specifically about well, what is a quantum simulator? How is it connected to a quantum computer? <clears throat> I then want to specifically turn to the optical lattice quantum simulators and give you just a single example since time is, is limited of what kind of calculations we can do and uh, where, where they stand basically in competition with, with other platforms and techniques. All right, so let's start out. Uh, and what is a quantum simulator? How is it related to a quantum computer? Well, maybe let's start first in trying to see what problems we are we're trying to, to solve. Well, I'm a scientist. I come more from the science direction. So the problems I'm, that got me interested in the field were problems connected to material science, chemistry, uh, strongly correlated materials, and trying to understand those systems better and uh, trying to basically get a have tools available where which we allow us to study the systems in, in, in great detail. And of course, uh, then with this knowledge, turn that to advanced kind of technologies, advanced materials, uh, drugs maybe that you could design with this knowledge. Now, one, one model system that plays a very, very important role in the context of material science in this context that has kept physicists busy for the last 30, 40 years is uh, the model of uh, interacting electrons on a lattice, the so-called Hubbard model which is believed to have strong connections to high TC superconductors. So there's an immediate, very, very big goal here uh, to basically understand how we can deliver power without uh, losses in these systems, but still this system defies understanding. So it's a good test case for all kind of quantum computers, uh, uh, quantum simulators. You know, it's like the reference model we want to basically understand in these systems. So I think we'll see a lot of uh, systems try to solve this big problem in material science, one of the biggest problems in material science as, as kind of the guinea pig model to show how good your system is in solving these uh, real world uh, material problems. So what are we trying to do? Well, uh, basically in, in this kind of problem, we, we know the microscopic rules of the system very well, how these electrons behave and interact with each other, but still we cannot calculate what kind of material properties emerge from that. That's simply because of the complexity of those systems. Or number two, the question could be, how should I change those rules to get a specific material property out of that. Yeah? So those are kind of the questions that motivate this. And those, of course, immediately have a lot of applications and technological relevance. So I would like to advocate that quantum simulators and quantum computers can, with a caveat, in some cases help. Not in all cases, but in some cases they can help to solve these problems. We'll hear more, I think, from Antoine also, how you can uh, likewise look at optimization problems, for example, some optimization problems, again, not all kinds of optimization problems that can be uh, more efficiently solved, or hopefully more efficiently solved. The point I want to make here is that the way these are solved is actually by mapping them onto a physics, onto a many body problem, onto a condensed matter problem, an artificial one maybe, but it's very likewise to solving kind of the, the problems we know from the, the material science world. All right, so, so what's the problem? Well, basically the problem uh, with the quantum system, as you probably have heard many times before, is this exponential complexity that basically a quantum system out of n particles, here these n spins, can be in a simultaneous configuration of all those particles. And just even to store the state of that system can require an exponential number of resources, exponentially large memory, and you quickly outrun any classical computer in trying to exactly solve that problem. Now, when I say that, we should, of course, be very careful because there have been fantastic uh, calculation methods on classical computers to approximate those problems. And that is because the typical physical ground state of a physical system only occupies a very small part of the entire configuration space that you have available for a system. And if you can find efficient classical numerical methods to approximate this smaller space, configuration space, then you can find very good solutions for material science. It's more when the problem actually addresses, you know, evolves into exploring this entire configuration space, which in physics we call the Hilbert space of the problem. That's where really this exponentially large uh, configuration space starts to hit you and you have problems solving for that. And that's something, for example, that very often occurs in the quantum dynamics of uh, systems. 
um, that we encounter these kind of problems where quickly classical computers uh, outperform. But I just want to really say we have to be a bit careful that because very often we, there might be good classical ways to solve this material science or chemistry problem, but we also, of course, have to find those approximate techniques that find this corner in this configuration space. Now, of course, the idea behind quantum simulation and quantum computing in general is to use artificial um, quantum systems to help us solve this problem directly in a quantum mechanical way. And in the past uh, 10, 20 years, fantastic number of uh, different systems have been advocated, ion traps, superconducting devices, the atoms and lattices, the Rydberg tweezers that we'll hear about today, all of them uh, have this idea uh, uh, common that you basically try to solve these problems in a quantum simulation perspective. So how do you do that? Well, basically you take your, your model system, which has a certain rule set encoded. The rule set basically describes how, for example, these electrons behave with each other on a lattice. You try this rule set we can express in a mathematical form that is written down, for example, here in a very simple form. We can try to encode this rule set on our quantum simulator. We can let the quantum simulator run, evolve in time, for example, and then measure the outcome of the quantum simulator to get the result. Or alternatively, what we can do, uh, this is the idea of adiabatic quantum computing, basically, we can start with the initial Hamiltonian, we can very slowly change the parameters of the system to end in the final Hamiltonian. And by going over from the initial to the final Hamiltonian, we start out with a very well controlled initial state, our final rule set our final Hamiltonian, the ground state encodes the solution of our problem. And if we do this very slowly, then we found the solution to this complex problem, which can be of different kinds. Um, the, pro the point I want to make here um, is that quantum simulation is basically adiabatic quantum computing, but with a caveat with a restricted form. So in quantum simulation, you typically do not control all degrees of freedom of the entire system. And if you cannot do that, you cannot have a universal adiabatic quantum computer, but you can still, the principle or the idea, basic idea behind it is still the same that you basically adiabatically change between these two, two rule sets. Okay, now what's the comparison? How does this compare analog uh, quantum simulation versus digital gate-based uh, quantum computing? Well, basically, again, you're trying to solve the same kind of problem. You're trying to find, for example, the evolution of a quantum system uh, starting from an initial state. And then basically you can do this either by encoding the rule set into your model Hamiltonian and letting it evolve over time in an analog way, or you can basically try to encode this rule set in a set of elementary operations in a set of gates that you concatenate after each other and building up on these kind of concatenation of these digital gates, you can basically build up any kind of rule set, whereas in the analog case, you typically only have a limited rule set available. The advantage, disadvantage of the digital approach, of course, is that it, you might need a huge, huge amount of uh, digital gates that you concatenate, and you might need error correction to be able to do that in an efficient way, as I'll actually show you in an example case in a second. So yeah, let me, let me, let me show you this here. This was a numerical simulation, numerical study done by Matthias Troyer at Microsoft, uh, Andrew Daly in Strathclyde, and uh, Peter Zoller in Innsbruck, where we tried to compare an analog quantum simulator, uh, how good you have to be on a digital quantum computer to simulate the same kind of quantum dynamics. And the system we took was this Hubbard model of these strongly interacting electrons on a lattice, a 2D system, moderate size, 10 by 10 um, system size, and try to simulate the dynamics, for example, over 10 hopping times, 10 evolution times in the system. And if you just put in the typical errors uh, that we have, calibration errors, decoherence properties of the physical system we have in the lab right now, and you compare what you would need to have on a digital gate-based quantum computer, you actually find that to produce the same quality of simulation, you would need about 1 million gate operations with a extremely high fidelity uh, that, that is written down here for these NISC type of devices that are available uh, at present. I think this just shows that for certain problems, while we are living in this NISC area of quantum computing, doing a, the computation in the analog way, if you can do it, can have significant advantages to solving your problems on, on these systems. All right. Um, okay, somebody's writing on the screen. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> um, quantum simulation. Now let me turn to the optical lattices and show you quite specifically what we do. 
So in our case, we basically create, uh, by interfering light beams, a artificial crystal. This is a crystal of light. This is an interference pattern of laser waves that show a bright and dark pattern, which is um, our crystal formed out of light, uh, in which we can load our, our atoms, uh, our ultra cold atoms, and they are basically trapped in this crystal of light and can move in this crystal of light and basically simulate the behavior of electrons in a strongly correlated material. Uh, we can do this with a few thousand particles, as I'll show you in a second, and we can do this with spin systems, so qubits, zeros and one. But I think more importantly, we can also do this directly with bosons, fermions, or mixtures. So electrons are, are fermions in the physical world, and typically when you look at material systems, you want to study the behavior of the electrons, so for fermions. And in order to do this calculation on a quantum computer, on a spin-based quantum computer, you first need to map this fermionic problem onto the spin-based quantum computer. And that requires a huge overhead in the number of gates and uh, available qubits that you need to do that. Whereas here, if we directly simulate the dynamics with fermions, for example, we of course don't run into this overhead, computational overhead problem. All right, let me give you an example now. <clears throat> so how this works, how we can measure this system. So we have these new tools available where we can photograph such a artificial cold atom system. We can take some single snapshots of this quantum state psi, which is maybe the ground state that we have prepared in the system that we're interested in. And when we want to uh, read it out, we take a photo of the system. And when we take a photo of a quantum system, which is in a superposition of these different configurations, what happens is that super this superposition state collapses onto one of those configurations. And this is the configuration that you would then see in the experiment. Then you have to repeat the experiment again, recreate psi, measure again, and it collapses onto another configuration. And um, at the end of the day, you basically get a probability distribution of all kinds of configurations that can occur in the system. And this is your output of the quantum simulator from which you can calculate almost all of the relevant correlation functions, for example, that, that you're interested in, in, in your system. This is actually akin to all quantum simulations. So this destructive process in measurement, all of them have to recreate psi again and then do another measurement to them. So that's not specific to a cold atom system that any, any quantum computer, any quantum simulator has this property, of course. Um, all right, so how can we program these devices? How can we, uh, on top of those lattices that we create by interference, shape the potentials additionally? Well, to do that, we use uh, these uh, digital mirror devices, which allow us to project arbitrary light patterns onto the atom so we can basically shape the confining potential to be a box with a special lattice. We can have reservoirs connected by a wire of light. We can have a box potential, as you can see here. So this, this light shaping gives us a lot of flexibility in what kind of physics, what kind of problems we want to study, and what kind of conditions we can program into the system. So let me give you an example of, of how we do that uh, in our system. So Here's the DMD pattern, this pattern we put on the digital mirror device. So each white pixel is the mirror tilted on. If it's a black pixel, the mirror is tilted off. Uh, shining now a laser beam onto this uh, mirror device pattern gives us this kind of light field. Shining this kind of light field onto the, the atoms can structure them in this array, as you can see here. Now you can basically have a readout, single shot readout, where you can see each atom on those different lattice sizes. When we average those, you can see the average distribution of the atoms in the lattice, showing you how, how well we can structure those, those systems in the lab. This allows us to create different kinds of systems. So, so this allows us to look at, for example, topological physics uh, in, these, in these chains, something that was actually also looked at by the beautiful TWISA experiments in, in Antoine's group. And we recently were able to realize a Haldane spin liquid in this phase. So it allows us to structure these kind of uh, systems, these lattices, and determine the end configurations, the couplings between those lattice sizes in a fully controlled way. We're also able to push the system sizes now to really nice system sizes of a few thousand particles. This is a 2,500 large mod insulator that you see in the system. Uh, by doing a little bit more cooling, we can remove most of the defects in the system. So we push out the entropy, the defects into the outside region, and the inside core is now a few thousand particles again with a filling of above 97, 98%. So that's nice in terms of the system sizes we can now reach with those experiments. So in terms of interactions that you control in these systems, 
you have many possibilities. So you can either have atoms collide with each other, that's direct collisional interactions. You can have uh, dipolar magnetic or electric molecules or atoms that can interact with each other through dipolar interactions. We'll hear much more about the Rydberg dipole-dipole interactions or something that people also use is to try to put these lattice systems into cavities and have light bounce back and forth between them to engineer kind of all-to-all -all interactions in the system. I just chose, I just want to show to you that this allows you to really realize a huge variety of different kinds of interactions and control these action interactions in a, in a highly uh, controllable fashion in these systems. All right, let me show, go a little bit more into how we detect these fermionic systems. In, in a fermionic system, you can basically have an electron that is either spin up or down, which is indicated here by a red or blue particle. You can have a no electron on a specific lattice site, that would be an empty lattice site, or you can have two electrons, for example, on that lattice site. And we would like to know when we take a photo of these images, we would like to read out the complete state of the system. So we don't only want to read out as in a qubit system with its spin up or down, we also want to read out if it's zero or two particles or one particle on that lattice site. The way how we achieve that is the following way. So we take this single two-dimensional plane, this is our physical system, and we then split this single physical system into two planes where the spin down goes into the lower plane and the spin up goes into the upper plane in the system. And then we take two subsequent photographs of the system. So this is the single 2D plane. You now separate them. You have the spin ups moving into the upper plane, the spin downs into the lower plane. Now you focus your objective onto the lower plane and you take an image of the spin downs then you focus the objective onto the upper plane, you take an image of the spin ups, and like that you get a full reconstruction of the spin ups and downs of the holes and doublons in the system. So you get a full configuration readout of this um, emulator of electrons in, in a material. Yeah? So imagine this would be like taking a photograph of a real material where you see each individual electron in this material. Uh, that's of course impossible in real materials, but here in these artificial quantum systems it's possible. So as a simple example that I want to finish off on, I want to show you this, this very intricate problem of understanding in this Hubbard model, the role of impurities moving in, in, in these 2D electronic materials. So uh, this is a seemingly simple problem, but we believe, or we, when I say we, the physics community believes it lies at the heart of a problem of, of high TC superconductivity. The phase diagram I've shown you here, here's temperature, Here's the whole doping of, for example, cuprate compounds, which are the most famous high TC superconducting uh, materials. And you see when we start to dope these systems, all these interesting zoo of phases pop up where we really have uh, not a very good understanding what's actually going on. And people believe that the essential physics uh, of this system is indeed captured by this Hubbard model I was introducing before. And it's basically the question of understanding how impurities that you dope the system with interact with the background antiferromagnetic order in the system, or what changes, what are the effects that can occur there. So in a simple picture, this captures everything uh, you want to know. I'm sorry if it makes you a bit dizzy, <laughs> but this is the, the antiferromagnetic order and you put a single hole in there and you try to understand how this single hole moves in this antiferromagnetic background in the system. And that's basically what you're trying to understand. And you might think this is a simple question, but even some of the greatest minds in physics have tried to work on this problem. Here's a paper from uh, Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and uh, Nick Reed, who, who worked on this it, precisely this problem, which was perceived like a Duncan experiment at that time, but now we can really do those experiments. So what actually happens if you put these holes into this antiferromagnetic environment, that they distort the antiferromagnetic environment around them, they create so-called polarons, where you have distortions of, in this case, the magnetic environment around that uh, single impurities that you put into this system. And those are difficult to calculate. Uh, they are difficult to, they have not been imaged before. And the quantum artificial quantum uh, simulators allow us to actually take images of these, these, these systems. And here I just, flash the, the, some of the results that we've been able to get from this direct quantum simulation of this magnetic polaron. This is how the magnetic environment around dopants, around mobile dopants, is uh, distorted, uh, resolved at the scale of single lattice sites. So we can directly see how surrounding those impurities, we have these uh, distortions in the system and directly measure this polaron. 
even more uh, more more complex uh, problem now starts to arise when you put more and more of those impurities into the system and this has been a big mystery in physics what actually happens when you start out with this polaronic uh, cloud here and they put more and more holes into the system dopants and then end up in the end people have found you end up in real materials with a normal metal the so-called fermi liquid and how this actually works how this crossover actually works has been basically a, a, a mystery uh, so far, but now with the quantum simulator, we can directly continuously dope the system and continuously track the evolution uh, of the system from this polaronic metal into this standard metal regime, understand how the conduction properties, how the microscopic structure of this material changes. So if you want to go to details, go to this publication. We uh, just want to basically just say we now really have a detailed understanding when this crossover happens, when this breakdown between these two very different phases of matter occurs. We can pinpoint at what doping values this occurs. And more importantly, I think now for theory, we can now compare our results to different approximate approximative theories that have been put forward and we can now already say which of these theories are good and which of these theories are bad and in that sense come back to my initial point that I wanted to make we can help try to find better approximations to this um, Fermi Hubbard model that can then be used for example on classical computers verified by this quantum simulation approach okay so just uh, next steps forward to so moving forward where we uh, going uh, next so of course, like everybody, we want to scale up the systems. I showed you we can now reach a few thousand particles uh, in the systems, electrons, bosons, uh, or fermions and bosons in the system. We are gearing up with new experiments and these monolithic cavities to make these lattices even larger to be able to go to system sizes of few tens of thousands of particles in these systems. Uh, I just compare this to, to the other platforms. A uh, few hundred, as you will see, have now been realized in the tweezer arrays. Ion traps are typically on the scale of 50 particles, 50 ions. But of course, one also has to honestly say that the level of controllability that we have in these systems goes down from ion traps to tweezers to ultra cold atoms in these lattices. And that's, of course, where we are pushing to develop uh, better, better controllability and programmability for these large system sizes that we have available. Finally, one other point I want to make that technological advance in programming these kind of quantum simulators relies a lot on, on laser technology. Uh, as I showed you, using these digital mirror devices to program the system, you typically put laser beams onto these mirrors and they create artifacts that you can see here, so-called speckle. You've all maybe seen the speckle pattern of a laser that are imaging artifacts that degrade the quality of your, your imaging uh, pattern. And we're really now working very hard to build new laser sources, which allow us basically to fight this uh, laser speckle problem, but still have this high power that we have available with the coherent laser light. And then eventually, hopefully when we, when we do this right, you'll be able to program each individual um, basically lattice link here. You can tell me what kind of lattice uh, coupling you want to have between those two links, what kind of offsets you would like to have and really control on a microscopic scale the full potential in these systems, giving you a huge amount of uh, um, configuration possibilities, programmability in, in these systems. All right, finally, I just want to mention uh, Antoine and myself, we are working together in this consortium, PASQUANTS, a new consortium, uh, programmable quantum simulators, where we're trying to push these different technologies forward. The uh, tweezer platform you'll see in Antoine's talk and later in other talks and the quantum simulation approach in the optical lattices. And I think actually while these approaches so far seem a little bit distinct, I hope and I think actually the future will see exciting directions in merging those two technologies. And I think Adam has shown very nice results in how this can be done. And I think there's actually a lot of potential for, for looking at this in the future and merging those two Adam uh, technologies. All right, uh, with that, I just to stop with giving you a few glimpses into the lab, how this actually looks in the real lab. So it's a complex, complex setup still. This all can be miniaturized if you put good engineers on it. We, we like our Lego systems. But I have to say all of these is basically programmed. All of these systems are programmed and all of our measurements typically run overnight in a fully automatized mode. So uh, in principle, one can, of course, hook these systems also up to the external world and have other people play around with them if they get a little bit more reliable and we don't need the, the students to run them directly anymore. All right, with that, uh, I think I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much. I hope I'm 
still in time with the talk and uh, thank you for your attention. If uh, you're interested in our research, you can go to our webpage, uh, quantum-munich.da. We have a also more, on, more larger quantum effort in Munich uh, expressed by our Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology. And if you want to hear more what's going on in this uh, Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology, you can also go to that webpage that you can see here. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for this really exciting talk. Um, I'm clapping uh, for everyone. Uh, we have time for very few questions. Actually, most of the questions came from one person, so I'll sample them. Maybe I'll choose a, you, you talked about the controllability as a challenge that you need to, to improve. Can you maybe quantify it and compare the current state to the other technology like ions and superconductors? Um, well, we, those are mostly gate-based gate approaches. So here we're pursuing not a gate-based approach so far. I didn't talk about this, but I think actually collisional gates between atoms were proposed a long time as an idea for, for gates, and they might have some interesting properties in addition to what you will hear from the Rydberg, uh, Rydberg side on those gates. So I think one might go back again, especially with lithium, there could be interesting configurations where actually you have very good coherence time and uh, very high fidelity two qubit operations, but that needs to be needs to be shown. Yeah? But I think that can be done. I think in terms of if you ask me now, this quantum simulation, the calculations that have been done here are far beyond anything that can be done on the superconducting platform. Yeah? The simulations I showed you for the 2D systems. I know basically of no simulation, serious simulation of the Hubbard system on, let's say, the superconducting platform. Okay, there's a technical question asking you to compare the DMD that you described, for example, to the special light modulator that other people are using for... I think both have pros and cons here. I would say it's pretty exchangeable. So I wouldn't say uh, there's a big difference in choosing either one. The DMD is maybe a bit simpler, uh, but you could, we could have likewise used uh, use the phase modulator. Um, Adi, uh, I will allow you to ask a question. Asif, can you unmute Adi? Yes, special treatment. Yes, Adi, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Uh, wonderful talk, Emmanuel. Um, I'd like to ask about, about the limitations. So you, you uh, measure the probability of occupation of uh, each uh, occupation configuration or the probability of each occupation configuration in your lattice, but of course you cannot measure the relative phases between the different components of the wave function. What uh, limits, uh, what kind of correlation functions you can and cannot a measure with this uh, limitation, with not, not, not having any access to the relative phases? I should say there's one other thing we can measure, which is current. We can measure the current operator on a bond. So uh, I and, uh, how do you measure this? Yeah, so how we do it is the following. Let's say you pick a bond, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you basically just turn, make the turn the particles. Not you now basically partition the system with double wells into bonds. So now you just have bond couplings in that bond. You mm -hmm. make the part in the system non-interacting, and then you just have quarter of a Josephson oscillation between this double well, and that turns the particle measurement into a current measurement. So if you after this quarter Josephson oscillation, you measure the occupation of the double well, it actually allows you to read out the current. It's a measurement of the current operator. So you can do that on a, on an, on the entire yes. lattice in, yes. in one shot. Take yes. photographs of yes. the of the current. I see. Uh, the, so uh, you can uh, also get a current current correlation functions. Uh, that's also possible. I see. Now uh, that makes it really exciting. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah.